Father in heaven, we thank you uh, for this uh, church family. Thank you for those who are gathered here. Thank you for those who um, are watching us on YouTube. And we pray for your special blessing on them, uh, that they're not able to be with us today. Please, would you speak to us now by your Holy Spirit, through your word, as we also pray for the children in their groups. In Jesus' name, amen. wonder what you thought when we had our Bible reading. I hope you've got it open, 1 Peter chapter 1. And did you notice the Apostle Paul, Peter, he said, not once but twice, be holy. Be holy. Now, what does that mean, to be holy? Uh, it doesn't mean that we have to be kind of full of holes, a bit like a really good cheese. No. It doesn't mean that we have to kind of have our head in the clouds, a uh, kind of halo, Floating, on, floating through life uh, or that we have to kind of retreat into some place away from everybody else. Well, no, it doesn't. To be holy is to be different, different from the world. It is to be uh, a little bit like God. It's not something you hear very much. You don't really walk down the street and hear one person saying to another, be holy. You don't hear it on the TV. Be holy. To our shame, maybe we don't even hear it in church that much these days. Maybe it's not something that we like to hear. Be holy. Since we're so immersed in worldly culture and media, uh, possibly the world's values come to feel normal, um, whether it comes to money or even sex and so on. And we're not sure if we like God's ways. So why? Why does God say here, be holy? And why should we be holy? We're going to see first an amazing motive. And secondly, a wonderful model. A motive and a model. Let's see first then the motive. And the motive is future grace. We're in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13 to 14 future grace. Look down, please, at verse 13. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. An older version of the Bible translated that more literally, gird up the loins of your mind. Um, Modern translations uh, paraphrase it. But you might say, roll up the sleeves of your mind. Maybe that's a a modern paraphrase. Roll up the sleeves of your mind. Sober up. Wake up. Uh, Not just to think clever thoughts. No, but so that you're ready for action. Ready to be holy. Now, why? Because the motive is future grace. Look at the end of verse 13 again, would you? This is the really big idea in this opening bit. Set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. God's about to tell us in the very next sentence, verse 14. Can you see verse 14? As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. He's about to tell us to be holy, but why? Why? The motive is future grace. Set your hope on the grace to come. Um, Nick, thank you for explaining so clearly uh, what grace means. The grace is God's present, his gift uh, that we don't deserve. Now, how could I possibly preach about holiness when I've messed up so badly so many times? Only because of grace. Grace. Now, Christians normally think of grace as something that we've already received and that now we've got. Um, it's like a, like, well, a new guitar, actually, that I got for my birthday. I was given it, and now I've got it. Um, now, that is the gospel, that we have received forgiveness. God has forgiven us. We receive friendship. He's made us friends with God as we trust in Jesus. And that's absolutely true if we're trusting in Jesus, and it's wonderful. And yet there is more grace. Um, Not only the grace that we have received, but if we're Christians, the grace that we will receive, that we're looking forward to 
when Jesus comes again. And this is the motive here to be holy. It's like, yes, I was given a new guitar for my birthday, but my family loved me so much. I think at Christmas, they'll give me another present at Christmas, a future one. And Christians are looking forward to future grace when Jesus comes again. Now, what will that present be? I guess it will be a thousand incredible things. Are we, are we okay? There's a bit of feedback, isn't there? Are we okay? Okay. What will that future grace be? What will that present be when Jesus comes? I guess it'll be a thousand incredible things um, of being in, in the heavenly new creation with God's family. And yet the greatest presence will be to be with Jesus, face to face, to be with God. This grace is the big issue in Peter's letter. If you've got your Bible, do turn, uh, flick over to chapter 5 and verse 12. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 12, where he summarizes what he's been trying to say in his letter. He's good at writing essays, you see. Here we are, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 12. With the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I've written to you briefly. Uh, is that a joke? I'm not sure. I've written to you briefly, encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. In other words, my whole letter has been about this. This is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. Again and again, Peter has mentioned grace just last week in verse 10. Chapter 1, verse 10, he said this. We saw this last week. The prophet just spoke of the grace that was to be given to you. Peter's readers are suffering badly. They're suffering as Christians there in northern Turkey. And Peter's big point is this. Since you have this grace and you're looking forward to this grace, stand fast as Christians. Be holy. Be different. Be like God. Why be holy? The motive is future grace. But how can we do it? What, how does that logic work? How does future grace motivate us to be different, to be like God? Is it that if we're really, really good, we try really, really hard, and if our good works are a little bit heavier than our bad works, that uh, we might be able to twist God's arm and he'll let us into heaven? Is that it? Well, no. Uh, we've clearly seen, it's clearly explained that we're saved by grace, a gift that we don't deserve. So what's the logic? It's like this. Imagine we're on a sailing ship and we're sailing to a promised land where, where there is treasure, vast treasure, gold, jewels, diamonds. Uh, and a promise that we'll receive that when we get there. And yet the sea that we're sailing through is dotted by a little desert island. And on the desert islands we see fake treasure. Little bits of glitter, diamante. And we're tempted to stop and to steal those shiny fake treasures. And we've got to keep going. We've got to remember the future grace in that promised land and not be waylaid. Jesus is coming back one day. If we're trusting in him, then the grace he brings will be far better than any pleasure that sin may offer. Those little desert islands, the fake uh, diamante. The pleasure that sin might promise. So let's roll up the sleeves of our minds and focus on heaven. See, sin promises pleasure or power or pounds in our pockets. It's those evil desires, verse 14, that we used to have. To be honest, we still have. How can we fight? How can we resist those evil desires? We have Christians, we want to, don't we? We want to de 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 defeat those. And the answer is by trumping them with a greater and more certain and more wonderful hope of future grace. Perhaps we think of, perhaps, uh, perhaps we think of a previous generation of Christians as quite strict in this area. Um, perhaps in saying, don't go to certain places, don't watch certain things which won't be helpful to you. Uh, there's a danger of isolating ourselves too much. Um, a danger of 
perhaps not knowing any non-Christians and therefore not being able to tell them about Jesus. And yet, on the other hand, I suggest our generation of Christians has perhaps gone too far the other way uh, to join in with anything and everything which the world is doing without stopping to question it, uh, without being critical, perhaps, of what, what we're absorbing in the media and so on. Maybe we're tempted to think, can't we have both? Can't we have a, you know, a ticket to heaven, brilliant, free ticket to heaven, and, uh, and give in to those earthly desires? Is holiness an optional extra for the really keen Christians? A kind of box that you may or may not tick. Well, no, it's not. See, holiness is precisely what we were saved for. The preacher, Kevin de Jong, says this about holiness. He says, my fear is that as we rightly celebrate all that God has saved us from, we are giving little thought and making little effort concerning all that God has saved us for. We don't earn a ticket to heaven by being holy, not at all. But those who've been given a ticket to heaven become holy. As the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. In fact, heaven is such a holy place that if we, if we don't want, if we don't at least want to be holy, we, we won't want to be in heaven. As the preacher C.H. Spurgeon said, sooner could a fish live upon a tree than the wicked in paradise. So every morning... Let's roll up the sleeves of our minds, get ready for action, and set our hope on future grace. May we excuse ourselves a certain amount of sin. We say, it's been a long, hard day. I think I deserve a little bit of naughtiness. I'll allow myself just a little. A little envy on social media, a little greed in overspending, a little lust in what I watch, a little outburst of temper. And we know in our head those things are wrong, but we lack the motivation to fight them. Uh, or maybe A, avoid those, those situations. Yeah, if it's getting late, you're getting those thoughts, we'll go to bed. And B, tell ourselves to say no to those few crystals of fake diamante. Set your hope on the future grace. Maybe you're not a Christian today. And thank you so much for coming. Maybe you think, this sounds too hard. I couldn't do that. Maybe we are Christians, but we think, oh no, I've failed. I've failed again. i failed too badly. I can't be a Christian. Now, either way, please remember, yes, we are saved to be holy, but we're not saved by being holy. We're saved 100% by grace, God's free gift. And if we feel that we're not very holy, well, that's a good place to start. And let's come and say sorry to God and bring that to him. And thank him for his free forgiveness. And ask him to help us to stand up again and, and begin to change. Oh, we've seen first the motive, it's future grace. Maybe we think, I get the motive. But what does holiness look like? What is this that we're really talking about? Is it just rules and regulations? Or is there some example you can give me to copy? Oh, wonderfully, we have the greatest example. Secondly, and much more briefly, our model is the Father God. Our model is Father God. Is verses 15 and 16. Look down, please, at verse 15. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy, because I am holy. Our model is Father God. Sometimes um, I'm not a great model father to my children. Sometimes I, I tell them what to do, and then I realized to my shame that I'm doing it myself. I'm, I'm not doing it myself. Maybe I, I tell them to, to, you know, to limit their screen time, to stop watching the TV. And then I realize I'm wandering around the house, checking the football on my phone or whatever it is. 
But God's not like that. God walks the talk. Yes, he rules, but he's also a great role model. He says, come with me. Come. Puts his arms around us. I will show you how to live. Our model is Father God. He's so holy. He's so different. In a good way, he's so much better, so much more glorious than us. That's where God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways. Isaiah 55. The devil would love us to think that holiness is something harsh, something severe, something that will spoil our fun, something you really wouldn't want to do. And of course, going God's way should be dramatically sacrificial. And Peter's readers were really suffering for their faith. And yet to be holy really means to be like God. He's so good and so glorious. Who in their right minds wouldn't want to be more like him? Our model is Father God. The 19th century Bishop of Liverpool, J.C. Ryle, um, he, called a, he wrote a book called Holiness. It's a great book. And J.C. Ryle said this. He said, holiness is the habit of being of one mind with God as we find his mind described in scripture. It is the habit of agreeing in God's judgment, hating what he hates, loving what he loves, and measuring everything in this world by the standard of his word. He said, whoever most agrees with God, they are the most holy. Back in the 1970s, uh, the singer Harry Chaplin wrote a song called Cats in the Cradle. Um, I don't think I was around at the time, uh, but you might know it. It's about a father and son. The son sings, uh, I'm going to be like you, Dad. You know I'm going to be like you. And yet that was the problem. Because in the song, the dad wasn't a great dad. And to the father's horror, he found out years later that he has grown up to be like me. My boy was just like me. The wonderful thing as Christians is that our model is Father God, and he is the perfect model. Peter quotes from the Old Testament part of the Bible, from Leviticus chapter 11, where he says, be holy because I am holy. Now, the application has changed since those Old Testament days. As Christians after Jesus, we don't generally need to keep the kind of ceremonial rules that the Jews had to keep, like not eating bacon, thankfully. But the principle stands. In fact, Jesus strengthened the moral uh, commands, those Ten Commandments. Be holy, because I am holy. This could help us in all sorts of ways. Maybe we struggle to tell people about Jesus. We find they don't particularly ask us about our faith. Maybe the first step is to ask God to make us more holy, more different from the world of their in a good way, more like God. See, if we behave like everyone else, why should they ask us what makes us different? I heard about a Christian sixth former this week. He gets on well with his non-Christian friends, but in his kind of social media group, um, he, he's called himself the Christian one. It's kind of name in his social media group. Um, it's very brave, isn't it? He wants to be known as different. Another Christian friend of mine feels quite ordinary. He's had a normal job all his life. He doesn't feel that he's a great witness. And yet every day he's prayed for help to honor God in the way that he does his work and the way that he treats those he works with. And every now and again, that's given him chances to speak of the Lord Jesus. Now, does this mean that we'll be perfect this side of heaven? Clearly not. In fact, the Bible says, if anyone claims to be without sin, they're a liar. And yet, God calls us and he will help us to grow in holiness. How? Maybe you think, I've tried, and I've failed. I keep on messing up. How to grow in holiness? Well, we need God to do it for us. Only he can really do it. So pray for it every day. And immerse ourselves 
in his word that will help us to be holy. Maybe read a chapter of Proverbs every day. That would be so good for us. And pray that as we do so, we will hear the song of God's heart. And we will catch that song in our hearts. And by his grace, become a little more like him. Why should we be holy? Our motive is future grace. Our model is a father God.